think you can hear me. That's uh, that's great thing. Thanks for all these. Uh, oh, wait, I should take the clicker. They told me that three times, but some things uh, you must repeat four times. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, um, okay, I'm going. I'm sure. You've heard a lot of things about this topic of women in tech. I know I did for sure. And um, there are so many initiatives that are talking about this topic. These are just some headlines uh, from the last 10 days of all the things globally that are happening and money that's been invested into getting more women in tech. And these are just a bunch of statistics why all these initiatives exist and uh, why we should think about the topic of women in tech. So for today, I was thinking that we go through each of these statistics one by one and discuss it. Now, I'm, I'm kidding. I won't uh, talk about statistics, maybe about some of them, uh, but definitely not all. And I'm sure there are so many more and you've seen it all before, so I promise I won't be that uh, too much of a data person, or, or, although I am. I just want to point out a few things. First, there are many data which shows and uh, relevant research which says that girls lose interest in tech starting the age of six. So that's, that's very early on. Like in Serbia, it's even before they start going to primary school. And then that interest continues to drop as they grow older. So for example, I just took out one statistics. This one is about Serbia, that uh, only less, approximately less than 20% of students in IT classes in high schools in Serbia are girls. This is the same um, in um, US, for example, it's like very low percentage. But what's more interesting for me, what was more, even more interesting is that out of those girls who start going to these programming classes, even a very small fraction of them decides to continue pursuing tech education. So even those who enter and say, okay, I want to do more about coding tech STEM, they move out of, uh, out of it. And one more, when, uh, what happens when they're in the workforce? Well, they are twice less likely to get promoted than their male peers. So it sounds like that wherever you watch and in every aspect of girlhood and womanhood, uh, when it comes to tech, we are not doing that great. So why are we still forcing women into tech when it's obvious that they don't like it and obviously they're not that good at it, right? Or is it? Uh, well, as I said, through these three statistics, it's really, really uh, difficult to say when you are already a woman in tech, it's really difficult to start talking uh, and saying, now these are the initiatives that should happen because it's all connected. So we should start from the very beginning. I promise I'll skip the, the baby phase, uh, but it's not not connected either. There are so many data points which shows, but uh, let's see what's happening throughout our growing up, both as men and women, and what makes, uh, what are some uh, things that are making women seem like they're not interested in, in, interested in tech. And before we jump in, I'll just give you a short glimpse why uh, you should listen to this lecture or why you should consider the things I'm saying. So it's not just some random person talking about it. So I'm an entrepreneur uh, in tech for uh, more than a decade and I've been part of the discussions about women in tech also for more than a decade. I started out with being, hmm, who cares? Uh, I'm a woman, you're a man, there's no difference. Uh, to now talking about this. Uh, so um, there's a lot that I learned uh, throughout this journey and it, my current venture or a project is that I'm trying to, uh, we are creating content and products uh, which are focused on little girls and how they um, can approach uh, technology and how they can see it in a different light so they actually don't shy away from it or drop out in the end. 
So let's start, I promise uh, we'll start from the beginning. So let's start from the childhood years. So uh, for example, I'm a mom of a two-year-old. Are there any other parents in the room? Not many. Okay, at least all of you were kids uh, <laughs> sometimes, uh, or know some kids or our uncles, aunts, and whatever. But you can notice, uh, if you look at it, that boys and girls become different very early on. So, for example, uh, you can see in parks that boys uh, uh, very early on start uh, being uh, in love with wheels and things that have wheels. For example, my son, when he was six months old, he, he would take the, the trolley from the park and then start just turning the wheel because it was fun and you don't see a lot of girls doing that at that age. And then on the other hand, there are different ways that we approach kids. So some of the things are something that we were born with or, let, or something that, that's part of our personality. And then there are some things that we as parents do differently uh, when it comes to children. So for example, I always ask myself, um, as a mom of a boy, uh, I was always super proud and super comfortable with him uh, even before he started walking, he would uh, uh, go around the park and he was constantly very dirty and uh, his uh, trousers would have holes on because he wasn't uh, walking yet. And I was like, yeah, well, we, we want him to fee feel freely. And then I would really ask myself question, would I do the same if it was a girl? I'm not sure. Even right now, I, I try to sell my tell myself I would, but I'm if I'm being really honest with myself, I'm not sure I would. But you can notice uh, a lot of other things, uh, how we talk with girls, not just us as parents, but other, other people and how we talk with boys. And there's a bunch of different research. So for example, when you see a, a young girl, more people would tell her, oh my God, you're so cute and your dress is so sweet. And then when you see a, a boy, you would say, oh my God, you're so fast, you're so uh, uh, brave. And those kinds of things that we are... Um, doing uh, e with ease and something that we are taught of are changing the way we bring up uh, boys and how we bring up girls. But I will just point to one thing that I was really shocked um, when, I saw, uh, when I saw it and when I found out, and that, that's that girls don't think, even when they are six, they don't think they are very, very smart or that women and other girls are very, very smart, which is their way of saying that somebody is genius. So girls are less likely in high percentages to think that they are geniuses than boys. And it was not proven uh, with one study, but four of them. Then on the other hand, it was also very interesting for me that us as parents also often tend to think that our boys are smarter than our girls. Um, if you uh, just want, I'll leave my con contact later on so you can get all these um, resources if you want to read more about the research. But for now, just trust me, <laughs> let's play with that. So for me, this was really uh, um, eye-opening about how we treat boys and girls differently and how they grow up differently and how their personalities are different. I'm not talking what is better and what is not, but I just... Uh, think that we, we all should be aware uh, and are aware and should embrace the fact that we are not the same. So on the other hand, like, I will, not, I will stop going into this boys and girls difference because that's not why we are here. We are here to talk about tech, but this is just a small intro and let's go back to tech and what's happening in the tech world. So what's happening in the tech world? For example, if you uh, look at the the way we teach, so we are at this childhood phase, the way we talk about tech, the way we present tech and we teach about tech, it looks like this. So for example, these are the nine best robotic, robotics kits for uh, kids. And this is uh, just one random pick, but you can find a bunch of them from a programming competition. This one was held in Belgrade, so that's why I took it. Uh, but it's usually, I, I was just, I think, uh, two weekends before, I was at an event, uh, um, another large uh, Serbian programming competition, which was even sponsored by Yandex. And over there, I spoke with uh, teachers and uh, 
private programming schools uh, 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 owners, and they were saying how 90% of kids who are participating in these competitions or who are enrolling into these private programming classes are boys. So this is not a, a, a pick I found online and wanted to uh, make it prove my narrative. It's something that's really, uh, really happening. So another one, just to prove the point. So these are top selling tech toys on Amazon. I know most of you said that you don't have kids, but uh, you probably know that this is not something that you would find in a girl's room. It doesn't look like that. It's, it looks more... Uh, like something that boys would rather play with. And um, I'm really, like when I look at this, I'm really fascinated how I really believe I'm, I'm a big fan of tech. Uh, and I'm really always fascinated how can we make tech do so many amazing things and so many different things and solve so many problems. And then when it comes to creating products for kids, we end up with this very... Uh, same <laughs> things, uh, and there's no diversity nor nor any other options if you want to to play with this. And if you don't believe me, I strongly recommend you to Google. Uh, you'll see. Um, and this is exactly why, for example, girls are dropping out, and why we mentioned the statistics that by after the age of six, they already start losing their interest in tech. And uh, also this topic that I'm talking to you about is something that uh, is one of the rare fields where I can say that academia and science has moved more forward than, for example, business community in the sense that they did the research and they have the data, but there's no people to actually implement it. So in the sense is what, what does the data say? Again, a bunch of different studies. They say that the girls are dropping out of uh, tech and losing interest because they are bored. They don't see it connected with things they like. And the other one is they are afraid that they will be the only girl in a group, in a class, in this school, in a summer camp. And they, they don't want to be that. Especially, for example, if you look at somebody who is in the teenage year, you know how uh, it's not an ideal position uh, to be that. So, uh, what can we do? <laughs> so, we should do exactly what I said, like change the way we talk about tech. You've heard uh, 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 change the narrative, change, change what we offer and what we present uh, as technology. Um, and just make it more diverse. Just show it, I, I always like to say that we should show technology in its full colors, because right now it's only in blue when it comes to kids. Uh, so for any of you, first of all, if you want to look up the resources before, uh, you can find them on this link. Uh, but also if you have uh, some kids in, uh, around or you know some parents of daughters, this might be an interesting link for you because it's our a free newsletter where we share exactly different kind of resources uh, for parents who, who do want to show other colors of tech uh, to girls. Okay, now let's move beyond the childhood phase and move to another one, which is what happens when these girls and some of them uh, start uh, thinking about what career to choose. First of all, I want to tell you one thing that for me was really shocking, but it was, uh, we looked it up in Serbia uh, and proved it in Serbia, but it was also proven in uh, US and UK in different research. Uh, it's that whether you'll choose a career in tech, it's completely irrelevant when you got your first computer. It's also irrelevant if anyone in your family was from tech occupation. It was also uh, irrelevant where you come from. Is it from a big city or a small city? And now we're going to talk about what is relevant. But before that, I want to show you one of my favorite graphs of the old, of all time. Uh, this is the percentage of uh, women who were enrolling in uh, different uh, 
majors, different faculties, and uh, as you can see, there's only one line that at one moment started dropping rapidly. And this red line is computer science. So at some point in time, around the 1980s, you can see that the computer science, there were more women studying computer science than there were women in medical schools. But then, in the 80s, suddenly, the number of women started dropping, and it's, it's, we can say it's dropping until very, very recently, and even if you look at this uh, jump, it's, it's, very, it's still very small. So, what happened in, in the 90s, 1980s uh, that led to this uh, sudden drop? Marketing. If there are some people from marketing, uh, this is uh, also a way of telling them how sometimes they, are very, they can really, really make a difference. But really, in the 80s, uh, PCs started entering um, our homes. And then uh, we, we started mainstreaming the conversation about computers and what computers can do. And unfortunately, most of the commercials were focused around men and boys. And that's the moment when girls who were enrolling in the tech, in the computer science, started thinking that it's not for them. They shouldn't be enrolling into this. Um, and we continue with this stereotype even right now. Uh, you can see it in a bunch of movies, uh, TV shows, uh, uh, pop culture, and even AI. Uh, so if you ask uh, ChatGPT or DALI, they are still not, uh, they are still representing uh, men as regular suspects when it comes to tech, which we can't blame them because it's true. But, some, but we should just think about the narrative that we are still maintaining uh, and, and not changing. So when it comes to choosing a career, when you see all of this, there's no uh, surprise to show you just one data point from uh, the beginning, which is that only 16% of girls get uh, are uh, that teachers or parents are trying to recommend them to enroll into tech studies. So only 16% uh, get this support to try and uh, enroll in some of these subjects. And just think about uh, how this is connected with, with support and what's, uh, what's driving us. And this is a great time. So, at this point, you can see that externally we get all these um, stereotypes, and that we get, uh, we see it on the television. Actually, who watches television? We not, but actually, we see it on different content we are consuming. We hear it from our teachers. There's a bunch of research which says that teachers also have these uh, uh, thoughts of what girls should study and. Uh, 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 are sharing it with uh, with with the with the students, but also uh, it's not just something that happens and stays externally. All these external uh, stereotypes are creating problems internally. So uh, this is one great um, concept that I would like to share with you. It's called stereotype threat, and uh, it's actually. What if they are right? I like to call it like that. The fear of proving that uh, all those stereotypes are correct. So, uh, in this case, women uh, are uh, having lower results because like the, the fear of proving people they are right in the sense that tech is not for them is leading to them uh, being more stressed and then even leading to them having less uh, 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 lower results than they would generally have. So as you see, it's like a vicious circle. So what we tell them also becomes something that we tell. Uh, so what we hear from you is something that we end up internalizing and continue telling ourselves as well. So, there's still this percentage of women who overcome all these barriers 
and who enroll into and enter the tech universities and end up with tech employers and start working in tech. Many of you in this room, many of us in this room. So let's see what happens uh, when we are at work. This is what happens. Uh, I don't know if you've heard for the uh, term leaky pipeline. I've heard of it recently and I really liked it. Uh, and it's one way to show, uh, to present this as well, which is uh, you have this way of women entering the field and moving, you know, uh, we, we are going into programming classes, then we go and uh, become, t study te tech university or computer science, then we go and get our first job. And then we are moving through, let's say, career ladder. And there's very small number percentage of us that, that, that ends up at high level positions in the hierarchy or even like in the middle management or team leadership positions. So we are dropping constantly. So once again, let me remind you that men are twice as likely to get promoted. Uh, and then another statistics when it comes to this, where are women uh, at work and what's happening with them is that they often are like 20% more likely to leave tech roles, like tech roles, tech jobs. So how do you see it? See a woman who is working in a tech company get going and deciding to become a project or product manager and moving away from tech. Or you see a woman who worked in, in the tech sector and is now trying to go into teaching or to move into some other, completely other industry. For example, one of my co-founders was a networks uh, expert. Uh, and like after 12 uh, years of career in that field, she said, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. Now I want to do something completely different and reinvent myself. Uh, and it turns out that women are more likely to do it than men, especially in the tech field. So we are, con so you remember leaky pipeline. So we are also leaving to go somewhere else. I'm not saying whether it's good or bad. I'm just saying that it exists and why it exists. Because in most of the tech companies and in the tech sector, in one way or another, women don't feel like they belong. And uh, it sounds, um, in this case, I would really say that it's really important who your team manager is, your team leader, and who in which company you work for. Because there are some companies that ensure and uh, make you feel more as you are part of the group and some that just don't. And in that sense, it's very important who you choose to be your employer and what happens next. But uh, um, either way, we should think of it this way. So in a team of 10 people, you have one or two women. It's very likely that conversations go sometimes uh, more often into the topics that those like random team conversations, which are not work related, end up into in some, uh, around some topics that are not that relatable or interesting to women. Or that some team, it's not rare um, that sometimes, especially in smaller tech companies, one of the team building uh, activities is playing soccer together. Um, and women are usually not like, not even invited in the sense, it's not like that they just, it, it's just not a joint activity. Uh, and then there is one, uh, so, so in that context, uh, the companies need to be, and companies and team leaders need to think um, outside of their, usually outside of their own uh, realms and uh, perspectives and look for ways how they can uh, find more uh, uh, common grounds and more common context. But it's not just that. Uh, there is one other thing that drastically changes how a woman feels uh, in any job, including tech jobs. And for me, it's really fascinating. For example, I know that I've, al uh, I've always thought that at least in tech, where we have such a shortage of people and where companies really care about people and you have so many different benefits that at least in tech, although women are minority, that there is this uh, important um, commitment to keeping these women. 
uh, keeping them at work because you need people and you need, so you don't want to lose out on talent and you want to bring new people in. But, you, uh, but unfortunately, the statistics is similar everywhere. And for example, I was fascinated that even when we talk about the pay gap in Serbia, the pay gap in the tech sector between the gender pay gap between men and the woman is larger in tech sector at the same level of uh, positions than, for example, in the other parts of economy. And for me, it was, it was really a shock. I wasn't expecting it. But then there is uh, one other thing that um, some and most of women uh, face uh, from time to time, and it's motherhood penalty. And what does that mean? It, it means it's, it's been proven through different, di uh, different studies, again, all over the world. Um, and even in, in, in Serbia is that you get like a significant pay decrease because you're a mom and it was proven that this drop is basically per child. So it's not like 5% uh, if you're a mom, but for every child it goes down and down and down. And what's especially interesting for me is that they've noticed something that's called fatherhood bonus. So it's like if you are a couple, then it evens out at least. I'm kidding, but not really. Uh, in the sense that uh, fathers generally get higher salaries and are offered higher salaries than non-fathers, uh, unlike moms and non-moms. And there was even one, uh, for me, fascinating study done, did, done by Harvard which says that um, if you are like, it, they interviewed um, and were investigating how many times in a month it's okay for you to be late for work, like for 15 minutes, half an hour. And it turns out that if you're a mom, you are, you need, that's three days. And you, if you're a woman and not mom, it's four days. But if you are a father, it's five days. So it was, it's, it's interesting how we uh, have, that, that's just a proof of our own um, stereotypes and our own like biases. So we, we tend to award, you know, like uh, uh, fathers who are working fathers and who are late because they took their kids to the kindergarten. But we are frustrated if a mom is late because she took their kids to the kindergarten. It's, it's, it's interesting. But have it in mind, especially if you have uh, parents in general, but especially moms in your team. And not to leave, like, let's just talk about the statistics, but let's see what we can really, really do about it. Um, one thing uh, that we've seen in some countries uh, uh, is this shared parental leave, and it's, it's, it's really working. Um, and this is something that companies, especially we can see it now that tech companies are starting to offer it so that parents can take additional uh, shared uh, leave so that it's not necessary that mom is the only primary caregiver because then it, it somehow uh, makes it more a, a partnership. Flexible work times, it, it's really, it showed that it really means a lot to parents in general, both dads and moms, because dad, dads can then help out more and moms can then uh, work around and not be punished for being late for work. Um, and the last thing, which is something that is easiest to fix and shouldn't cost much, is rethinking what is valued and what leads to career growth. This is not related just to, for moms, it's both for moms and dads. And that, that that means is like, what, for example, women are like more likely, there is a bunch of research to say that women are more likely to believe in meritocracy. So you won't see women pushing to get a higher, uh, to get this promotion or to ask for a raise. They usually think that if they're doing a good enough work that will be seen and they will be rewarded. As they grow, go up through the career ladder, at some point we understand that that's not how the world works. But especially for lower levels, I think that the employers should be aware of that. But on the other hand, especially for moms, for us it gets more difficult to stay at some events after 5 or 6 p.m. It's very difficult and if they, these types of attendances which are not 
work time related or what is rewarded when you are considered for a raise or when you are considered for a promotion or for any type of visibility or a reward, then it might uh, look like you are not really um, creating an equal opportunity uh, workplace or that you can move some things, uh, some things around to make it easier uh, uh, for moms. So just to conclude uh, with what was the topic, uh, I wouldn't say that women are not good at tech. I wouldn't say that women are not interested in tech. I think just that the way we present tech to them from the very early age to the, very, uh, to, to the time they are in tech most often is not uh, in line with what they see valuable and what they see interested and that's why we see them dropping out and especially uh, as uh, time goes by, by and then as there are more and more things that um, women have to do in terms of household uh, and uh, family, then it gets even harder to navigate uh, that sense of not belonging somewhere and women then tend to uh, shy away and move away from tech. That's it. I already heard the sound, I think, but I was good. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Zoe, so much. I'm super excited to have you there, here and talk about this. Uh, we're going to start the Q&A session. Just a reminder, if you want to ask your questions, you can ask them both in Russian and in English uh, by scanning your QR code. I'm going to start with asking some of the questions I had for you. Uh, first of all, I love the fact that you had so many statistics because it does help when you're talking to skeptics like me. And I know you were saying that you were in the beginning also saying, what was the difference? So I have, maybe it's a two part question. First, how did you change? What actually was this turning point where you mm -hmm. changed your opinion? And how to appeal, how to actually change the minds of people who are skeptics and saying, you know what? They should just figure it out themselves. Well, I, I think we should figure it out ourselves as well. I'm like, um, I'm thinking, but I think understanding how things work make it easier. Uh, so for me, it was, uh, so as I said, uh, I was very young when I started getting those invites for, uh, why don't you participate at this Women in Tech panel? And why don't you say something about the role of women in tech? And uh, the geek in me was like, okay, I want to participate, but I need to say something relevant. I don't want to speak just my mind because I'm, I've never really thought about this topic uh, a lot. And then uh, one of the first things I did was I, I read Lean In, uh, the book by Sheryl Sandberg, now quite an old one and now even a controversial one. But I have to say that that's the book that, that really changed my perspective in which ways that's the first time where I understood actually what an imposter syndrome is, although it was never mentioned in the book. But they, they, they said some things which I was reading and I was like, okay, I thought these are my personal traits. And now this book is telling me these are my personal traits, but all of all the other women that I know. So for example, that we need to be at the hundred percent to apply to a certain job, uh, or that we don't like that this, that I mentioned about meritocracy and all these values and things that I thought that it's my internal value system. It's and it, it, this book showed me that it's, it's like somebody read my mind and they didn't. <laughs> so in that sense, it was really scary. Um, so that was for me. And I think that uh, um, we shouldn't force anyone into uh, having a view about it, but I think that we should all be open to uh, trying to figure out our own biases. Like, um, the thing I just mentioned, I spoke with one friend and he's the one who told me, well, you know, like we have a group, uh, uh, we have a hangout, uh, European representatives of our company and we have a mini soccer tournament and it's so awesome. And we're getting to know people from other regions, uh, la la. And I asked him, well, okay, but do you have something like that where women can also participate? And he was like, no. <laughs> and I just like, okay. 
And he was like, wow, that's so wrong. Like mm. he figured it out himself. It wasn't like, it, it, I don't think that anybody is doing those types of things because they want to harm women and keep it only for men. I think it's just the, e, the, the people are doing some things automatically. Hey, I want to do a soccer tournament and you speak with some, oh, let's do it. Oh, it's awesome. And nobody thinks, uh, well, should we do something else? Should we, should we th figure out something that to, to enable the entire company to network and meet other regions rather than just one and things like that? So for me, that, that's some, um, not like saying, oh, that's wrong. You're doing it only for men, but just making conversation. Cool. And do you typically see, I don't know if you saw that in your conversations, um, is it typically more men or women that have these biases against women? Like, not w against women, mm -hmm. but ag like saying, well, actually, the state of things is not as bad. Um, I think it's both. Uh, but for me, like, um, it's just different types of biases. Uh, like, for example, uh, but, but I really, like, I remember very often when there is, uh, when, for example, I'm on some stage or some smaller group and it ends up being all women, then everybody was like, oh my God, are we going to get along? We are all women. And I'm like, I, I think that's one of the biases that women are, uh, don't like other women. Uh, and I think for that, it's just us women. So I, I know that when I consciously, consciously changed my way of thinking about other women, I got so many more friends and allies Mm. Uh, so um, you are one of them as well, <laughs> but in, in that sense that I think that, that, that that's something that only us women can do uh, and influence. Thank you. Let's go. And we have a few actually questions in yeah, the we chat. We have some questions from, the, from our participants and you have talked about this feeling when um, a girl can feel uh, like she's the only girl in the room and our participant asks, have you ever felt like the only girl in the room and if so, how did you cope with that? Oh, I felt so many times. Uh, most of the times I, um, I, 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 got, I got to be the only woman in the room so many times that it just didn't uh, exist in my mind. And there's really one funny story. I was invited to uh, an event of one uh, uh, US Serbian startup and they, got, they had investors uh, from around the world and they wanted to have like a dinner with them and some representatives of the Serbian startup community and I got invited. And when I got there, I started talking to people, meeting people, it was interesting. And there were like total 15 of us. And I felt normal, like I've been to such events for a long time. And then at one point during dessert, when we started like getting up from the table and networking, suddenly like four or five young women came in and this other friend of mine who was at the dinner, he said, oh, Zoya, I feel so bad for you right now. And then it shone on me that I was, during the dinner, I was the only woman. But then when those ladies came, they weren't startup members. They were there to entertain these foreign investors. And that's the moment when I realized that I should go, so not to allow for some misrepresentation of what I'm doing there. But for example, that was the one of the very weird situations that I encountered. And I know that some other women from the startup ecosystem had these similar events, either in Serbia and in other regions. And I think people should <laughs> think about it more. I have actually, I know we have only a few minutes left, but I, there's one question from a man. And I wanted to ask because it says, do you strictly disagree that pregnancy and childbirth temporarily decrease the smartness? I, I disagree, yeah. I, I, I don't think I, it may, but I think it's also one of the, uh, yeah, I, I was pregnant and I don't think I was more stupid, but I was definitely more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that, uh, like I, uh, that, that helps, and I think that even when women make a long break from anyone, woman or a man make a longer break, you just don't feel as confident as you did before. So I think that might be the reason why we like to say, oh, we are stupid. Mm. We are, our brain is not working. Yeah, and probably we have time for last question. Uh, Adana asks, don't you think that a gender salary gap exists? Because men are more, li are more likely to change uh, the job and position than women and women can be on the same position for a long time, 
and are rarely going to job interviews and etc. in comparison with men, yeah. Yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, so uh, when you look at the research, the, the pay gap exists from one, one is definitely that women change jobs uh, uh, rare, more rarely. The other one is that women negotiate less for uh, salaries and ask, uh, rarely ask for a, a, a raise. Uh, but there's also one reason, uh, which is what I mentioned, this motherhood penalty. For example, it's very, uh, uh, for women who have more obligations at home, like once they leave work, and at some points uh, it's estimated that it's one whole shift, another whole work shift, it's very difficult to apply for jobs or look for interviews or think about changing jobs, especially if that's one of the stress full events uh, in one's career. And I think it's something that employers should have in mind. Uh, so for example, the way you can attract a woman to move to another company is different than how you would attract a man from uh, another company. So in that sense, we, we can change that. I think that the system right now is more attuned to what men uh, feel like, which is normal, they're the majority, but I think there are some fine tunings which can make it more easy. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, just we have a few seconds left. Um, can you tell us one word that would identify and signify this like IT phenomena of the year? Wow. <laughs> um, AI. Cool. Yeah, Thank you. AI. Thank you, Zoya. Applause. <laughs>